So we've been studying issues of globalization and global financial crisis. This leads us to think about the relationship between global economics, development, and poverty. So with me again today is Professor Smith. So Professor Smith, can you tell us a little bit about some different perspectives on economic prosperity and specifically how the development of free trade and open markets leads to prosperity? Sure, in theory, access to global markets should create conditions in, in which people, particularly that exist in poorer countries with smaller markets, have access to global markets and can take advantage of opportunities offered by access to, to consumers around the globe. Uh, that should lead to a scenario in which global linkages uh, basically lift all boats, as we had talked about earlier. Again, that's in theory. The question is whether or not that always works in practice. And as with everything else in the global economy, it works sometimes and other times it doesn't. Let's make a distinction between free trade and open markets, what some might call fair trade uh, or protected markets. Um, what, how do you make that distinction and, and how do we understand whether one leads to more prosperity or the other? Yes, I think the best way to illustrate this is through an example. Uh, I know that in the past it has been the case that some developing economies, if we take Ghana for example, which produces co raw cocoa, they have for a long time exported that to European Union countries where they manufacture chocolates and many other finished products that have what is known as a, a high degree of value added. Taking the raw product and adding through many processes, adding a lot of value to the product and actually profiting off of that. The structure of their tariffs has often prevented countries like Ghana from rising up the value added chain and exporting finished product, products to European countries. So what we have is a situation in which, yes, there is global free trade. There is opportunity there for Ghana and Ghanaian farmers at one level. On the other hand, you see that there are limits to this process when trade is managed, or as you say, is um, uh, when there's protectionism as opposed to pure free trade. So uh, notions of fair trade would suggest that the arrangements be altered in such a way that opportunities be created for those farmers to move up the value added chain, chain and actually uh, become uh, wealthier as opposed to continuing to be dependent upon, say, raw materials prices of their cocoa, which really fluctuate with global markets and are beyond their control. So instead of trying to get that raw material for the absolute bottom dollar and not sharing some of that value added, the wealth created from that value added, that would be an example of how you would engage in fair trade, is that perhaps prices might rise or perhaps companies in the developed world might share some of that wealth with those who are producing raw materials. Is that a right, reasonable or, way of understanding it? As with the global, the, the, the fair trade movement, in many cases, the deal is to sort of cut out uh, middlemen who earn money from uh, buying the raw material and then marketing it in the wealthier countries uh, and instead go directly to the producers in exchange for imposing conditions. Some cases it involves organic farming. In other cases, it simply involves criteria uh, contributing to sustainability and high quality of the product. In exchange for that, ensuring that those uh, farmers obtain a fair market price. That's part of the idea of fair trade. And I know there are, there are many examples of where the fair trade movement has grown globally. Uh, but if we get into a discussion of the impact on poverty, my understanding is that the impact remains very much limited. Well, this, this does raise this issue of the relationship between prosperity and poverty. Some might suggest that it's a zero-sum game, right? As we've been talking in the past about how all boats rise with that rising tide of globalization and free trade and open markets, some might suggest that it's actually a zero-sum game. And as some boats rise, some actually sink. Now, we talked about this earlier, and there might be various explanations for that. But in this case, I guess the question is, you know, are those that are becoming richer off of these raw materials um, causing those to become poorer in the developing world? No, I think that's an excellent and very difficult question to answer. Uh, I'm not sure that they're systematically impoverishing those people in the developing world. At the same time, it's clear that if we go back to the example of the cocoa processing, there are manufacturers in European Union countries that clearly lobby their government against relaxing trade restrictions on those products. And so those governments and those, the, the, the uh, people in the, the, who own those firms who are lobbying the government clearly are preventing the economic rise of some of those, the, the producers of the raw materials, even if they're not systematically impoverishing them. So 
Is it a zero-sum game? I'm not so sure, but it's clearly not necessarily a positive-sum game where both sides are, are gaining. It may be that most of the benefits are almost exclusively on one side. Well, I guess that's the issue, is whether some might be benefiting more than others and whether we can actually accept that. So if it isn't a zero-sum game, then what might be contributing to extreme poverty around the world? You know, there's, uh, uh, like, as with everything else we've discussed, there's an extensive debate and a long-standing debate about this, many different theories. Some say, for example, that aid, which on, one, on the one hand some argue is the way to uh, address extreme poverty, some say that aid is actually the cause of extreme poverty because it cultivates dependence. Uh, there's an interesting argument made by uh, the political economist Jeffrey Sachs who suggests that what's at work here is poverty traps, that there are uh, impoverished people in poor countries that suffer from the cumulative impact of multiple different deficits, access to clean water, disease, inadequate capital to invest in future earnings, lack of uh, education or lack of access to education, uh, and that all of these things accumulate so that even when aid is targeted at one or two of these things, it's not really creating lasting consequences. Sachs's argument is that what needs to happen is a major uh, massive program of aid that exceeds anything that we have seen in the past that targets all these deficits simultaneously to lift people out of poverty traps. Others argue that, that in fact, that massive aid is precisely the problem. What needs to happen is if we're going to have aid, it needs to be much more targeted, uh, driven by local knowledge, and geared toward uh, encouraging local entrepreneurs that can create prosperity uh, from the ground up. So students, tell us what you think. Is free trade something that helps all those boats rise? Does everyone benefit? Or are there some who win and some who lose? Would fair trade be a better option? Let us know what you think.